Chapter 4 If you want the happiness of self, get rid of the body-mind sense. We spend our lives always searching after happiness. Could you define what is happiness? You won't be able to. Do you want the happiness of having a wife? The happiness of eating food? I want the happiness of self. If you want the happiness of self, get rid of the body-mind sense. There are plenty of things to talk about, and I can, but don't talk about anything irrelevant. Think about that self or the touch of I amness only. Make that the very core of your being, and you will understand that itself is the manifest Brahman. Interpreter If you have read the book I Am That and wish to make any comments, you may do so now. I would like to know what is the knowledge you have of your own self that you are. You are here, right now. What is it that you are? To know that you are is that knowledge you are without words. Sometimes there is a mood of happiness, which I cannot explain. At that moment, nothing can be explained. Now that I'm sitting here, I can say it happens like this, but that again is a bodily experience. I call it the prior most I principle, prior to anything. Subsequent to that, the five elements come out of that, conjuring up the space and the remaining four elements. So there, in that prior most principle, we have to stabilize. The question now is, is one stabilizing downward or upward? Common parlance has it that I am getting elevated. My position is getting higher and higher. But it is not so. We have to subside, settle down into our original state, in our prior most state. So I prefer to call it the lower state, to subside into one's foundation, sink into the source. From that standpoint, what is knowledge? Knowledge is that which is collected by the words or their meaning, which means the mind. But that is not self-knowledge. Self-knowledge cannot be captured by words or the mind. You are sitting here. You are prior to words. Now the hearsay goes, I am. I am means the flow of mind has started. Now, whatever you say with that I amness through the mind about you, you have represented as yourself. But that is not so. The traditional knowledge comprises whatever is collected through this mind or through the words externally. But that is not self-knowledge, which is prior to that also. How could there be any bondage or shackles to the Atman? It is only the meaning of words which one accepts for oneself that becomes the shackles. We want only that self-knowledge which is acceptable or palatable to the mind. Not true knowledge, but that which is accepted by the mind is only a yoke. The Atman principle remains untouched by the meaning of the words that flow from it. Even the four aspects of the language, para, pasyanti, mariyama, and vaikari, do not touch it. Words trying to describe that original primordial state invariably fail. That is why the mind sinks into quietude, and why the Vedas settled into quietude. And when there is no words to use, it means there are no Vedas. Even in the worldly everyday life, you must develop the conviction that whatever language sprouts out of you is the language of the Vedas only. This means that you must have that purity in you. We must be purified to that extent in order for the Veda language to come out of us. It is not a question of being purified or not purified. One has to understand the principle. Whatever I say, you must apperceive directly without the filter of the words. Because if we accept the words, what happens? Based on those words, we create a concept. And then based on that concept, we accept that for what we are. We create an image based on a certain concept, based on the words we think we are hearing. But that is not yana. Only which that is directly apperceived is knowledge. The capital we have is this knowledge I am. But what have we done? We have handed over that knowledge to the body and we say, I am the body. 
Thereby we have reduced the totality, the limitless, to the limited, a specified, insignificant body. And that is why, being unable to give up this association with the body, we are afraid of dying. If any idea is traumatic, it is the idea of death. Why? Because we are not able to disassociate ourselves from this identity with the body. The knowledge I try to convey will not be acceptable to the average person, even if he happens to be interested in spiritual knowledge. This is because he expects something from the point of view of the body, this identification with the body. In that state, as an object, he wants to get something, knowledge as an object, which is impossible because knowledge is purely subjective. How amusing it is that all of you are listening to what I am saying, but do not accept what the words are trying to express regarding your identity. You listen, but the real meaning underlying the words is not accepted. There is no receptivity for what is being conveyed. It is only a rare one who directly apperceives what I am trying to say without the words. One in ten million. You all entertain a certain concept, and whatever I say you are trying to have within the limits of that concept, then you say, yes, that is acceptable to me. You listen to me once, twice, or several times, then at the end of a certain period you come to the conclusion, I have not benefited from Maharaja's words. Why? Because based on the words you are trying to create an image about yourselves. And when whatever I say appeals to you according to that concept, you say, yes, now I have got the knowledge and now I understand what Maharaj is saying and Maharaj is right. Why? Because what I say appeals to your concept. I would like to know from all of you whether what I say appeals to you as truth and is beneficial. I repeat, when does one say that it is beneficial? When it tallies with the concept one cherishes. Then you say, yes, it is beneficial. And when it does not tally, you say, sorry, that does not appeal to me. It is not for me. We stick to the words and the meaning, forgetting that what we are is prior to even the beginning of not only the word, but also the first basic thought. Then there is no communication, no grasp of what is being said. I started saying that that which you are is prior to any words or thoughts. So that cannot be identified as such. You can have a word and meaning for almost anything. But for this sphere, literally, being, there is no author, no word. Any other thing has been or can be acquired, but with respect to this, there is no acquisition. You are that. Many of these japi tapis, even those who consider themselves as yanis, are still entangled in the concept based on certain words. Any mind or word created design can have no real significance to you, for it is only conceptual. Your true nature is that it can have no color or design. I have read the questions and answers from I Am That. I found it hard to understand how Maharaj, though in the body, always answers questions from the highest level only. And somehow it has filled me with the greatest happiness. It may be bodily happiness also. I do not want to say anything about that, but both of us, my son and myself, have had supreme moments of joy, peak experiences, if you like, during the reading of some of the answers. Because I am stabilized in that foremost absolute principle, all the talk will emanate from that level only. Whenever you talk from the five elemental bodily or consciousness state, that will pertain to the worldly life. But this is purely the knowledge related to the highest. Sitting in Maharaja's presence, I had a certain bodily experience. How should I understand this? In trying to understand the experience, whatever significance your words and concepts give to it will be acceptable to you. But that is not the knowledge. That is why I am not very keen to ask people to stay for any extended period of time, because if you do stay that long, you will not be able to understand. In the course of your initial eight or ten days, whatever is somewhat understood will first have to be properly digested, 
Until then, any further talks will not be absorbed. Assuming that a person is knowledgeable, then what will happen is this. Having left this place, he will not be able to remain alone for long. He craves company to whom he can deliver the goods of spirituality. He likes to seek out somebody with whom he can talk and discuss spirituality. Otherwise, he feels very unhappy. Will you feel happy and satisfied if you don't encounter other sadikas? The question was asked whether it is necessary for a serious seeker to go through this stage where one likes to dole out whatever knowledge one has to share with others. My answer was that this is a part of the process, but that it also must come to an end. This desire to discuss and exchange views on spirituality. That highest state is the unborn state in which there is no experience. Side note. According to the translator, Maharaj is not feeling well today. He is very weak, almost in a daze. Before the sickness or my present condition, I was there. The sickness has come as a temporary phase, but I am prior to that. People normally feel when sickness comes that they are going to die. But I am not going to die. There is no death to me. But it is the sickness that will accept it. If a sick person will remember this principle only, that prior to the sickness he was, and his true nature is ever prior to the sickness, if he truly realizes this, then the impact of the sickness will be less. On the other hand, when so-called knowledgeable people are sick, they accelerate their death by imagining that they are going to die. What do you understand by the word dream? How do you understand a dream? Is not the dream something like a drama, a play? In the light of the consciousness, all kinds of play take place. The dream is one of these, and in the end, it again merges into the consciousness. To the one who realizes that this consciousness is an indication of his presence, that it is in fact conscious presence, when I am conscious, it means that I am present. All bewilderment ceases. Thus, within that presence as such, there is no individual present who sees something. That is, there is neither the seer nor the seen in the impersonal presence. Again, I repeat that impersonal presence is merely an indication of presence as such, not of an individual. It is an assurance, a guarantee of one's presence. If I have consciousness, it means I am certain that I am present. To one who really understands what has been said here, a dream is no different from what is seen in the waking state. Both are plays in the consciousness. Because of the light of consciousness, we call one thing the waking state, another thing the dream. But in essence, both are events happening in the consciousness and essentially are not different. In this impersonal presence as such, the only thing present is the light of consciousness without any form or shape. Whatever is seen, is seen in that light. Many people are under the impression that they are acting in the play. But this is a mistaken notion. All that happens is that the light of consciousness shows various things happening. The actor is part of the play. Why does something appear to us as actual or real? because something that one sees every day or often conveys a sense of reality or actuality. Therefore, we accept it as more actual, more real, than something that appears in a dream, but essentially they are the same. How is a yani? The yani is like the cigarette lighter without the flame. When the lighter is lit, the consciousness comes in, and whatever happens is seen in the light of that consciousness. But whether or not there is the light of consciousness, the yani is ever there. In deep sleep we are like the condition of the unlit lighter. There is no light, therefore nothing happens. But even in that state the light may come on. From the moment that slight consciousness arises, the dream occurs and one appears to act in that dream, as part of the dream. I repeat, I am not talking about what happens to an individual. I am only talking about the total manifestation and how that manifestation arises. Because of the impersonal consciousness, there is the impersonal presence. 
but a difficulty arises, because while the composite consisting of body, vital breath, and consciousness has no shape or form, we identify all three with the body, and so we become unhappy. But once we realize the basis of it, that the total manifestation is only in the impersonal consciousness, which is presence, impersonal presence, there is no longer any difficulty. On the other hand, so long as this charge of having a male or female body is not removed from that which exists impersonally, the trouble will continue and unhappiness will persist. This composite of body, vital breath, knowingness does not know itself as I am in the absence of that knowledge I am. The vital forces also are self, without form. Similarly, the knowingness has no form. Now this vital force depends on the food essence body to sustain itself, and on the manas, that is the mind. It also feeds on the mind. This vital force is the agent for all activities, and this knowledge I am is a mere witness, yet this entire composite must be available. To repeat, that vital force does not know itself. It does not go into activity in the absence of the knowledge I am. And that knowledge is available only if a sustaining body is available. Now so long as you do not remove the charge that is this vital force, and the knowledge I am is male or female on account of bodily association, you are bound to suffer. Maybe the examples I have given are somewhat pedestrian, but my intention was only to create a stronger impact. How would a Yanni feel when he gives up his body? What type of pleasure or bliss does he experience? Imagine a newlywed couple. The pleasure which they derive from their wedding night is as nothing compared to the highest bliss a Yanni gets when he quits his body or his life force. I call it the highest bliss in the best festival on the highest day, the term normally used in spiritual parlance. Compared with the love play of the wedding night, whatever pleasure the couple realize in coming together, the happiness Ayani derives in getting separated from the vital breath and the knowingness is thousands of times superior. They, the couple, are coming together. He is coming apart. Take the example of this cigarette lighter. The lighter is something like Nirguna Rajas, that is the heat state. My original true state is Nirguna Rajas. Now on the lighter, and because of the lighter, that flame appears. In the flame, the knowledge I am is there. The mind is there, and the vital force is there. The vital force carries out all the activities. The mind communicates, and the knowledge I am is merely a witness. This is the actual state of affairs. For the emanation of any talk, the flame must be available. That is the I amness. The vital breath and the mind must be present. Then only the talk can come out. My state is Nirguna Rajas. I am like that lighter only. The flame may be there, or it may not. I am Nirguna and Nirajas. I have no attributes. In my state, that beingness is absent. Similarly, I do not require any Rajas. That means I don't want any entertainment activities. In my true state, nothing is. When the knowingness or I amness state is there, and the vital breath and mind are also present, this being the Raja's state as compared to the Niraja's state of the lighter, some occupation or entertainment is essential. This can be observed in all of us. We can never stay idle. We are always occupied with one thing or another. When the vital breath quits the body, the I am this also goes. What remains is only the Niraja's Nirguna state, the former I call the flame state. That is the I amness. Earlier, I said the Saguna Brahman state. That is, the body is there. The vital breath is there. And the mind is there. And that knowingness or I amness is there. 
All that is being entertained by Maya. The state in the absence of this beingness or the Maya is that Nirguna, Niraja's state, Maya Tita, prior to Maya, the absolute state. A hundred years back, what were you? At that time, you did not have the knowledge you are. The memory that you are was missing. Presently, in the temporary phase, you have the knowledge you are. But to have this knowledge, what are the prerequisites? The essence is required. Sattva guna. This means the quintessence of the food essence is necessary to sustain I amness or this beingness. And that essence in turn depends on the food body. But all these together, that is, food body quintessence and the knowledge I am, the vital breath and the mind, these all are a temporary phase only. So long as food essence is available, the knowingness will last. How to escape from all this? This knowingness is to discover itself. It should realize itself. Then in the process of its realization, it is able to quit this state and abide in the absolute in the non-knowingness state. So one must abide in oneself first in the knowingness state. Whenever you sit for meditation, you hold on to the form concept that you are a male or a female. Give up these concepts. To do such meditation is almost impossible. Only a rare one will do it without that identification with the body-mind. Might get a glimpse of your state as to what you are, intellectually, that is. But in my daily life, I am so much under stress. My wife thinks this way, somebody else thinks that way. I'm always under tension. So how to get rid of this? I am telling you a simple thing. Get rid of the notion that you are this corpse. The body is dead always. The body is inert. It is alive only by the means of your I amness. You are not the body. Hold on to this concept very firmly, and then whatever happens, it is not yours. There is quite a big gap between that state and my present state. There is a considerable time gap. I have to do sadhana, purify myself and all that. How can I manage to do all these religious and worldly duties in my busy life? You have recourse to naturopathy. With that, not only will you do good to yourself, but also the society. Do all the social work and you will enjoy lots of merit. As to me, I am fed up with this entire waking state and sleep state. Without these two states, I was in the perfect, peaceful state. Did you ever hear the words sorrow and misery in the absence of the deep sleep and waking states? The knowledge I am is the product of interaction within the five elemental state. You are not that. You, as the Absolute, are not the knowledge I am. Most of us are not satisfied. We are fed up with life. There is some urge, but it is not sufficiently strong to withdraw from this daily grind. How can you dispose of this problem? You resent that you are the body, that you are the mind, you are this sattva guna? I am not the body, that standpoint you must have. It is very simple. The body and in the body, it is like a coin. On one side, you have the vital breath for making all possible activity. And on the other side is the knowledge I am. Only when the vital breath is there, the knowledge I am is present. When the vital breath leaves the body, the knowledge I am also disappears. And both of these are the product of the food essence body. I am not that. This entire composite, I am not. This you have to realize. Who are your ancestors? They are the food particles, that food essence. Those food essences are your real ancestors. On the earth there is vegetative growth. I call it Vanaspati. The quintessence of that vanaspati is the food essence. Out of that grows vachaspati. The latter means insects, worms, bees, mammals, etc. All types of creatures. They survive on this essence of vanaspati. Now in the vanaspati juice, that quintessential vegetation juice, there is also a particle 
a granule which contains the sattva guna, the rajas guna, and the tamas guna. The particle quintessence contains all three qualities. The sattva guna is mere witness, beingness, a touch of I amness. Rajas guna is activity. This guna leads you to activity. And tamas guna represents the claiming of authorship, taking the credit for the activities. Unlike what one can read in the scriptures, your ancestors are in these grains of wheat and rice, and the essence of those are our ancestors. Therein, the real essence of our creation is contained. Chapter 6 The Experience of Nothingness There arises a feeling of sadness when one hears from Maharaj that I will have to return again and again so long as I have not attained the state of joy, of realization. It is just like that flame. You can quit this cycle of travail when you understand that you are not that flame. You are not this composite. So long as you entertain the notion of being a name and a form, you are bound to be enmeshed in your own concepts. Why does the flame appear? That is its very nature. If my nature is in the lighter, why does a flame appear? That is not a relevant question. Why does the rain fall? Why should the sun shine? There is no cause for the world experience. For your own experience, there is no cause. But you presume that parents are the cause of your existence. Because you respect your parents, you accept they are the cause of your existence. Otherwise, you spontaneously came into existence. All the knowledge that science and technology has given us is because of inquiring. Why does it rain? Why does that move? The whys and wherefores of everything. Does Maharaj want us to quit all this science and technology and dwell in our inner being through withdrawal? That is a way, but how to balance things after all? We have to live and work. Science may eventually combine different kinds of juices and create a human being, but it is not going to contribute to the general well-being and peace. The peace will go to pieces. There is only one solution. That is to find out why you are. What is the cause of your being? I am. Actually, you had no knowledge that you are or you were, but at this moment, you know you are. Why is that? understand its cause. You alone know why you are. Why is it offered to you that you are? You alone know. Don't ask anyone about it, but inquire by yourself. Don't bother about others. Worry only about your own self. That knowledge I am is the product of what is due to what. How and why? Inquire only into this matter. Nine months ago, the child was not there. Now, just three days back, the child was born. And he is crying. What is the child's crying? What is this child? How does he happen to be? The child is crying due to what? The product of what? The world is manifest and expansive. Don't get lost there. Just inquire as to why you are, how you are, how you happen to be. You were not there earlier. At present you are. How has this confluence taken place? From the you are not state. There are many different councils. Go and visit different countries, do this, do that, do social work, get acquainted with different people, etc. Also there is withdrawal, having read the scriptures, Ramana Maharshi, Krishnamurti and others. So the mind is doubting. For this withdrawal one needs the help of a guru. Is this guru predestined, as it says in the Vedas? You know I have seen different gurus. I have been to Krishnamurti, Maharaj, Ramana Maharshi, and have read various books and different teachings. Rajni seems to have a modern way, science and technology also. Maharaj gives one dimension only. He says, withdraw, be desireless, and be active. How to decide who is the best guru? I am telling you a simple thing. Accept one statement from any guru. Assimilate that fully and believe in yourself and consider and accept your own self as the guru. Accept no one else as such.
The final prerequisite for this spiritual precept is self-confidence, a firm faith in oneself. If you have no faith in your own self, you are hopeless. You are an outcast. Yourself itself is the guru. Do you understand now? The guru is Brahman. The guru is knowledge. The guru is Brihaspadi. And the sum total of all that is your own self. I want to ask about God's grace and free will. The bare fact that you are alive, you are, that itself is the grace of God. And all the activities that happen through you are the expression of the grace. In such situations, if something bad happens, remember that you are, merely because of the grace of God. If the grace of God were not there, that you are would not be there. So remember that you are itself is the grace of God. What about the question of doing japa, reciting the name of God? The whole significance of doing japa dwells in your faith. You must have faith first. Your self-identity is nourished by such faith through japa. Don't do anything mechanically, for then there is no soul in the recitation of the japa. If you don't recite soulfully, there is no point in it at all. Do plenty of dhyana yoga meditation. Practice meditation more and more. I would like to make room for newcomers. Eight days for them only. That should be sufficient for everyone. Some people I will request to stay. I can't explain why, and some people, although they would like to stay, I will send away. There are various kinds of seekers. Some come exclusively for knowledge. They are not interested in the person who delivers it. Once they get the knowledge, they go. Other people want knowledge, but for them the priority is guru worship. Devotion to the guru comes first, and only incidentally they collect knowledge. There are some great sages who in their seeker stage used to do devotion or worship of a god only for namesake, but because of their intensity of devotion reached their goal. The one who is doing devotion to his guru, to such a person, even the god is devoted. Interpreter Because of Maharaja's sickness, many types of experts have come here to offer their advice. So today, one person told him that he knew of a healer who could diagnose an illness by feeling the ten fingers and ten toes and could then suggest some treatment. So he approached Maharaj whether he would be interested to have such a person come to see him. But Maharaj said he was not interested and continued to state, I am not the least interested in this daily ritual of getting up in the morning, eating, and again sleeping and all this. I have had enough of all that. I do not expect anything from this world. I am not going to achieve, attain, possess anything because I am fed up with that very consciousness out of which this world is created and want to get rid of this consciousness. People are visiting this place. I treat them with respect and reply to all their questions. But this does not mean that I expect them to come daily. Although they come here, it does not mean that I am seeking their association. I would like to be alone. Whatever natural experiences you encounter, just accept them as they come. Just be with them. Don't try to alter anything. Whatever is today, it never was. And whatever is today will never be in the future. Knowing this entire game of consciousness or maya, the great sage Yaneswar made his valedictory prayer before taking samadhi. He prayed to God and said, Let the desires of all be fulfilled, any kind of desire, and then let the bad people be punished and let good intentions develop in the hearts of people. In spite of that prayer, there was no change in the sum total of those bad things and good things. Finally, all this play, the sum total of all these bad things and good things, is illusion only, and there is nobody responsible for the creation. It has spontaneously come about, and ultimately it is an illusion. So there is no question of rectifying or preventing that. It will go on in its own way. There have been so many sages, japi tapis, seekers practicing japas and tapas, austerities. Spiritual seekers of various orders, they have come and gone, but I raise no objection to whatever they say or the way they behave. I have no comments on them. 
I have come to the conclusion that the world is spontaneously there without any seed cause. Its creation is seedless. But in the world it is full of seeds for me. Procreation or recreation is going on all the time. Since Maharaj is a yani, he must be despising this whole world as something very mean and low. That question does not arise because from my standpoint the world is not. You indicate to me where is the world. What is the world? Can you point your finger and say, this is the world? The world is not. It is a mere appearance. Having attained knowledge, how is it that you have been able to associate with various kinds of people? Some fellows might be very bad. Some people may be obsessed by their minds. Some people are good. How could you get on with all such persons? Who is to get on? I have no pose, no stance, no fixed form of my own. If I had, it would be difficult to relate to anybody. Since I don't have any form, by nothingness I have become the subtlest. So I can fit into anything, any situation. Suppose a man is rich. He is wearing a lot of ornaments and expensive clothes. When he leaves his house, there is always danger lurking. This is on account of the fact that he represents so many ideas, concepts, and because of his reputation that he is somebody, that he is a rich man. He is afraid of going into the street. A naked beggar who goes into the street has nothing to lose. Similarly, having lost everything, I have nothing more to lose. I can encounter any situation and fit into anything. So long as you wear a name and a form, all these problems will be there. In the absence of name and form, there are no problems. Let us say I have land and property with farms, etc. About the time of the rains, there are always concerns, such as whether I will be able to till the soil, whether there are seeds available, etc. All such worries exist. After losing the farms, I am freed from such concerns that all can be ignored. While sticking to your name and form, you have to worry about things. In the spiritual pursuit, you gradually lose your form. And as the form is shed, the name also detaches itself. There are ever so many customers. All are out to gain and possess something in the name of knowledge even spiritual knowledge, but nobody is a customer for the true self-knowledge. I will tell you about the normal tendency of a person. There is the story about an old man, quite well off, who had a very satisfying family life, had worldly possessions, and had lived to about a hundred or a hundred and twenty-five years. And now he lies on his deathbed in his village house. Normally in the villages, even the cattle shed is attached to the main building itself. So you can watch from the bedroom and see the cattle shed. Even on his deathbed, he will not be inclined to thinking very noble thoughts. He will not be contemplating something very high. He is looking at the calf, and the calf was chewing a broomstick. He was very worried about the broomstick getting damaged, so he was shouting, Off with the broomstick! While about to kick the bucket. He was calling out, The broomstick, the broomstick, take care of the broomstick. While uttering that broomstick, broomstick, he breathed his last. The traditional concept is that whatever strong concern one has at the time of death, he will be reincarnated into. So probably he will be born as a broomstick. The question is, what yardstick exists to measure the progress of a seeker? A very weak man was not able to walk. Gradually he started getting stronger and began to walk. So then he knows that he has regained his strength, does he not? The indication of one's progress is shown by your disinclination to associate with so-called normal people. Your desires and expectations get less and less. Please ask some questions, but don't ask anything about family life. Ask only about spiritual knowledge. You must have an intense hunger or need for it to get self-knowledge or spirituality. The complete world picture you get through the five sense organs and the combination of that multiplied by a certain factor represents your worldly needs. Just like a fish 
out of water, gas for water. So you must covet self-knowledge. When out of intense hunger for spirituality or self-knowledge, the floodgates are opened, you start rejecting everything, from the broomstick to Ishwara, up to your own consciousness. You shed everything. In the worldly life, with the power of money, you can purchase anything. Similarly, by donating the self, you get the Brahman state. And when you donate the Brahman state, you get the para-Brahman state. In the first state, you become the manifest consciousness. In the second, or the last state, you surrender the consciousness also. At the end of the process, you are the para-Brahman. I know the experience of nothingness, and I just wanted to know where do I go from here. In that nothingness, what is present? That you which has been present in that nothingness has had the experience of nothingness. Who or what is that? Someone or something has had the experience of nothingness. Now, what is that someone or something? Complete emptiness. What is that experience itself? Does it have a shape or form? I can't think of any shape or form for it. That which has no shape or form. Is that you? I don't know. I have only had this experience and I feel every thought and everything else was just a lot of rubbish. Everything in the world is just a lot of nonsense. It has no meaning. The only thing I have got is nothing. That is the only thing that has any meaning. I can't express it. That is all right. But in the balance of all this experience and no experience, what is it that you think you are? What is your knowledge about your own identity? What result have you got? What is the balance sheet? Ultimately, what is the conclusion you have arrived at about yourself? Is there something at all, or are you also nothing? I am nothing. Don't use the word I. But what is it that is nothing? I don't know. Have you done any meditation? There was a seminar of EST, a four-day course of continual meditation. I went to one of those, and that's where I got the experience of nothingness. What does EST stand for? EST is an organization. It means to be, in French. It is a regular institution that gives seminars. The answer you have given is correct. But with that answer, there is nothing further that can be said. Have you come to that conclusion with conviction? Yes, I have. You see, I have felt that this nothingness, if it indeed is the ultimate reality that I have been looking for, then I am not happy with it because it does not seem to nurture me. If there is nothingness, then there is nothingness about, nothing left of, an individual either. So who is it who is grumbling? who is not satisfied with the experience with the nothingness. If there is nothingness, there must be total nothingness. There can't be an individual who is away from it and can still say there is nothingness. So what is this individual who is not satisfied with the total nothingness? Which is it? Who is dissatisfied? Who is grumbling? In that nothingness, the individual also must be dissolved. Then who is it that is grumbling? Who is it that is not satisfied? Oh, grumbling means there is no interest now in doing anything or fighting the battles of life as we used to do before, like warriors. Interpreter. So that individual has been dissolved? There is nothing, absolutely nothing. Interpreter. Then where is the dissatisfaction? Dissatisfaction must be felt by somebody. How can one live in this world? Interpreter. But who? That is Maharaja's question. The physical body, the physical manifestation, how can it live and how can it survive on this earth with a form if all the time it has got this concept of complete nothingness? I come back to the same thing. What is it that has to do anything in this nothingness? What is it that is left in this nothingness who has to do anything? Perhaps this nothingness was only a beginning and was just a quest like everything else. Something has turned into nothingness. What is that something that has turned into nothingness? 
This consciousness that I am, that I exist, that concept itself has turned into nothingness. So what is left? Who is left? Nothing is left. The answer is 100% correct. But I wanted to find out how steady you are in that nothingness. What is or is not? Don't argue about that. We can only talk about what has happened to you. And you as an individual or the conscious presence has been dissolved into nothingness. That is all you can say. Once you are in that situation, there is nothing. Whatever work you do, whatever your behavior, is the work and behavior of that child of a barren woman. That does not exist as an individual. No, I feel as if I'm an observer to this whole thing. It is all a massive play, you know, an act. If the one who observes that is also dissolving into nothingness, then what? But he can't because the physical body is there. The answer was 100% correct. Therefore, I assume that that to which this answer has been has also been dissolved into nothingness and that there is no individuality left. But from your subsequent treatment of this problem, I conclude that this individuality still remains. Therefore, my final answer to you is that you continue to do your sadhana. The yani who has this experience of nothingness, his individuality does not remain. So whatever happens, he no longer has an instrument with which to undergo any experience. But in your case, you say that nothingness is there, and also your individuality. The two are incompatible, that is mutually exclusive. Therefore, continue to do your sadhana. If you really are at a stage where you find the nothingness, what then is left to do anything in this world? There is nothing left, but then what should I do? Commit suicide? You are not there even to die. No, I appreciate that. That is not the answer either. Nothing is an answer to this, but where do I go from here? The lady was explaining that there are all kinds of S-type of methods and systems which come with the promise of liberation in 10 or 12 days. As for myself, I no longer care about all this. I have come to this nothingness in which the search has ended because the seeker has also disappeared into that nothingness of which we are talking. I no longer take any interest in that search. First, I have seduced Maya, and once the Maya surrendered to me, I had no other use for Maya, so I threw her out. Thousands of organizations have come and gone. Thousands are yet to come. All of them are based on a certain concept. For example, one had the concept of untouchability. Now, to a certain extent, that concept of untouchability has gone. But have the people, because of that concept, been able to realize their true nature? Therefore, none of these organizations have any use. The ultimate thing is to find out about one's true nature. In this, organizations can do nothing, because they are all based on a certain concept. But this organization put me in touch with my beingness, and that is the whole point. In that very nothingness which we have been discussing, the individuality should have been dissolved, so that there is no longer anyone who is satisfied or dissatisfied. How could he be satisfied? Because there is no longer anything to be satisfied in, in that nothingness. So what you have got is not the real thing, although your answer was 100% correct. Only that individual who has lost his individuality has merged with the Parabrahman. So the individuality must go. The entire world moves on the basis of one concept, and that is, I am, the fundamental concept of one's individuality. When the basic concept is, I am nothing, how can the world move? That is what I am trying to express. If you had come to the conclusion that you are not, then how can any further concept or any further question arise? If you had really come to the firm conclusion that I amness is no longer there, how can any further question arise at all? That means there is nothing further than that? Everything that is there, it is fullness and it is nothingness. So long as I do not have that I amness, 
I no longer have the concept that I am an individual. Then my individuality has merged into this everything or nothingness, and everything is all right. But there is no everythingness, it is nothingness. I do not get the feeling of everythingness. This is what I am trying to say. So, if there is nothingness, then who is it to do anything anyway? Assuming that there is nothingness, who is there to search for anything, even everythingness? In that nothingness, you also are not there. Then who is it that wants anything more than this? I don't know. Again, the answer that you don't know is a hundred percent correct, because in that state where you did not know, you did not even know that you existed. And this I amness has come subsequently without your wanting it. And whatever knowledge you have now has been accumulating since the arrival of this I amness. But in your original state, the not knowing is there. The problem is, where do I go from here? Who? The question is, who is going to go anywhere? It started with the whole thing and the circle is now complete. In that nothingness, we are also nothingness. So who is to go anywhere? For whom are there any more questions left? In that nothingness, anything is nothingness. You are also nothingness. Your question is very much like the child of a childless couple asking, Where do I go from here? Where is he to go? And from where has he come? I will continue with the same old simile. A very old couple are held in great esteem, love and reverence by all their acquaintances. So the couple dies. All the acquaintances decide that they must do something for the child. But the child had not been born. For whom could they do something? Once the knowledge of the self dawns, there is no longer any question of good or bad, suffering or not suffering, happiness or unhappiness. The question just does not arise. Are there any further questions? If a yani is beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, he must contain consciousness. The yani, after all, is the totality. How can that which contains consciousness not be conscious? Knowledge, the entire manifestation, is the form of knowledge, yana. But the yani has no form or shape. He has transcended consciousness. Therefore, whatever acts is the universal consciousness and not the yani. So don't talk any more about the yani. Rather talk about this consciousness, individual consciousness, or the universal consciousness, which is the basis of all your thoughts. So that subject you should discuss. Forget about the yani, because he is beyond that. And whatever you think the yani is talking about, it is not the yani talking, but the universal consciousness. Whatever you discuss, it can only be on the basis of this I amness. Forget all about this yani aspect. Inquire only about the yana. That is where the shoe pinches, this conflict between yana and the yani. However high you go, however deep you go inwardly, unless you become a yani, there will always be a path that goes beyond it. One will not be satisfied with the universal consciousness. One will ever want to go further. There is no question of anyone becoming a yani. The yani is out of time, so one cannot become one. A yani in the process of stabilizing in the yana state possesses for some time the pride of that I am Brahman state and therefore talks about it. That, however, is not the ultimate yani state. I will not participate in any concepts of yours. There are a group of ethical concepts, loyalty, gratitude, justice, keeping one's word, etc. Now it has also been said that this is something beyond good and evil, neither good nor bad, etc. But certain groups of concepts, like those I mentioned, seem to be inseparably connected to the concept of the man of achievement. In other words, one assumes that such a man would somehow embody these qualities. My question is, is that right or is it just an illusion? Interpreter, what do you mean by a man of achievement? A yani. Interpreter, ah, but a man of achievement in the world, that is quite different. 
All the qualities you mentioned, as well as all possible qualities you can imagine, are in consciousness or knowledge. The yani, however, is beyond all qualities and concepts. Okay, I have one supplement to my question. Does such a person want interpreter? No, because there is no person. Therefore, all the qualities are in knowledge or the consciousness. The yani is beyond all concepts and all qualities. He is no longer an individual. Therefore, whatever applies to an individual does not apply to him. That is the answer to the question. All the misconceptions arise because we think of the yani as an individual. The yani has lost his individuality. Maharaj explains that he is not only not an individual, but he is also beyond the duality of manifestation and non-manifestation. Do you have any questions? No. What has happened? No questions? Silence is a good defense, self-protection. Maybe you are afraid to expose yourself. Is it correct to assume that somebody who is to be what Maharaj talks about will ordinarily manifest the qualities of justice, loyalty, gratitude, honesty, etc.? That is not necessarily so at all. Even a murderer can get knowledge. His past deeds or the absence of these good qualities never come in the way. A classical example is Valmiki, who wrote Ramayana. For every murder he committed, he put a tiny pebble in a vessel, and in this manner he accumulated seven enormous vessels filled to the brim. All these murders he had committed did not prevent him from being a yani. Ultimately, all these concepts can and must be understood to be false. But the difficulty and the essential thing is to be convinced that the original, basic concept, I am, itself, is false. You like the talks? I like getting answers. Having obtained and digested the answers, one's ego must gradually dissipate. If there are no further questions, we will close this meeting. Chapter 7 when consciousness manifests, duality appears. If you want to remember our coming here this morning, treat that as the highest God which gives us the sense of presence, this conscious presence, which makes us feel that we are, we exist, we are alive, we are present. If you do, it will unfold itself and give us all the necessary knowledge. You must have the firmest conviction that this consciousness is our parent principle, the highest God. Then you will have all the necessary knowledge. If there is one principle which can save us, which is our only capital, it is that which gives us the sense of presence, this consciousness. Be one with it, pray to it, and treat it as the only God. Whatever we have, whatever we acquire, it is only because of this consciousness. And to be one with it, we don't require any implements, any instruments, any money. There is no expense involved. This consciousness is free of inhibitions, any conditions, and being without obstructions, it is totally free. If we resort to it, it will also make us free. Why is it that the yani is not aware of the universal knowledge? Why is the space unaware of anything that has happened? How is it that the sky is not affected by the events happening on earth? Behind the four elements, air, water, fire, and earth, space is always there. What is meant by a pure heart? Interpreter, please don't ask frivolous questions. Whatever energy one has to spare, let us spend it on valuable questions. One question usually leads to another, and there has to be a starting point somewhere. So a question like this is moving ahead a little bit, stimulating more questions. Interpreter. Here it should be just the other way. The frequency or the intensity of questions should be getting less and less. If your questions are multiplying, something must be wrong somewhere. Yesterday I came here and found the I am. What do I do now? Nothing else. That is all. You forget it and go. I have been to Tiruvannamali. 
quite a number of times in Ramana Maharshi's ashram. A German lady there showed me a book on the teachings of Maharshi and told me a similar teaching in philosophy existed, that given by Maharaj. How long have you been going to Rama Ashram? Only for the past five years. Interpreter, did you read his, Maharaj's book, I Am That? I only read one or two questions on the subject of death. You have been reading Ramana Maharshi's book and found it interesting. In what way did you find it so with reference to yourself? My orientation has been basically Advaita Vedanta, so that I've been reading his book. Interpreter, having read those books, would you like to ask any questions? I am feeling happy in trying to follow this philosophy. Is there a necessity to meet a living guru, or is it sufficient to have faith in a guru who has left his body? The aim is to awaken yourself to the faith in the self I am. That is the entire purpose. So whatever is inducive to that development, you may accept. Supposing you have faith in a living guru, then accept the living guru. If you have faith in a guru who has left his body, accept that guru. But is there more benefit to one type over the other? When you were not knowing anything, what was the first thing you came to know in your whole span of life? The South, and then came other things. You started with knowing nothing including you did not know yourself, so what is it that you started knowing first? I started reading the Gita, reading Krishna. You did not know anything. You did not know yourself either. So where is the scope of Gita? At this time in your life, when you were not knowing yourself, what was the first thing you came to know about? You started knowing so many things after you started knowing yourself. You came to know I am. And then you came to know other things. How did that happen? It happened probably because of my previous karma, my prarabdha karma. These are all stories you have heard. After you came to know yourself, you started knowing so many things. But what knowledge did you have before even you came to know yourself? One comes to know all kinds of worldly things, but the world does not bring me any happiness or pleasure. But reading these books, Please reply to the question. I have probably not understood properly. The question. How did you come to know your own self? Afterwards, you can do so many things. How did that happen? The self came to know this body. First of all, this knowingness appeared. The knowingness I am. Later on, you embraced the body. Correct. Hold on to this only, and don't ask any questions. I am addressing the consciousness. Am expounding consciousness in terms of the same consciousness? You came to know yourself. I am. To abide in that is itself the bhakti, the devotion. Before the appearance of I amness, where is the devotion? I have a question. I have not heard anyone starting questions. I gave you special time for that, but you did not speak up. Whatever you have heard applies to you totally and exclusively. Accept that fully. The state you were in before you embraced the body as yourself. That state is the guru of all gurus. That is Brahman. Not even the Brahman. It is the Parabrahman only. Subsequently, you begin to fall into grosser states, and finally you embrace the body as yourself. Before you occurred to yourself as I am, you were in the highest state, the guru of gurus, the Parabrahman state. Later on, you started filling up with all kinds of grosser matters, and you came down to the body sense, I am the body. So all these impurities have to be removed. Until then, you have to stay put in quietude. Your fall started with the appearance of that beingness I am. With the appearance of this knowingness, I am, the next fall was embracing the body as I am. And then you gathered so many things onto yourself. All the other things you gathered to yourself are unreal. You, presently you, are in quietude. Is it on this side of sleep or on the other side of sleep? You are only the consciousness feeling the consciousness. Consciousness touches the consciousness. 
You are heading for that experience known as death, of which you have heard. And you have to realize how that death experience is unreal. With all our experience in the world and notwithstanding all our struggles there, we are heading only towards the inevitable death. But that death is unreal. If death were real, then the death of one animal would signify the end of the entire species. So long as the consciousness I am is not stimulated into knowingness, there is no knowingness at all. That very stimulus, that I amness, is the source of the entire manifest world of yours. In the absence of the awakening of this I amness, where is the question of mine and thine? Only after the appearance of I amness, I and others come into play. Without this I amness, there can be neither I am nor others. If you investigate this aspect of spirituality, then there is no question of birth and death. But if you don't investigate this particular aspect, you remain involved in the cycle of birth and death. If I know myself, if I realize myself, may there be a transformation in my worldly life? What do you mean by worldly life, and what do you mean by transformation? Your worldly life is all your concept, is all your mind, only. We are dealing with that principle which is prior to mind. This may be described by saying that you are putting on various shrouds. Before you know yourself, that was your true state. Your first shroud was that of I amness. Then you embrace the body as yourself. And then so many other shrouds. All these shrouds have to be peeled off including I amness. From the no-knowing state, the first veil I took was that of I am. That was formless, nameless. But I embraced the body. I got a form for myself. I got a name for myself. This was the fall. Therefore, all sages advise, give up the shackles of the body. I am the body. These are the shackles. Give them up. How to get rid of this body-mind sense? How to forget? Who remembers and who knows that he remembers and forgets? The one who knows the memory and non-memory states is bodiless. He is prior to body and mind. If you can imbibe totally the essence of what is being said right now, you will stabilize in the Parabaraman state only. You are not beginners in the sphere of spirituality. You have acquired a lot of spiritual wisdom. Now please ask questions. The one who distinguishes between different states, this is with the body, that is bodiless, this is this, this is that, stands quite apart from all those things. And you are the one who distinguishes. You are the one that is the purest, the most auspicious, the cleanest. Since that is your state, you are in a position to assess the quality of other states. With this understanding, carry out your worldly life family life with full zeal. But the point is this, if you really understand and abide in what I say, naturally, your desires and expectations will fall off. With the falling off of desires and attachments, there comes a feeling of not wanting to do anything. That leads to the Parabrahman state. What is the use to that state of all the ambitions, expectations, desires? What does it need? Nothing at all, for it is the perfect state. You get to the point that you don't care for anything anymore, neither the Brahman state nor anything. Yes, you won't care to know that you are the Brahman also in that state. Would you take delivery of this talk, except all of this? A little. Interpreter, it is not child's play that he is talking about. There just seems to be a total disenchantment with the world. What do you mean by disenchantment? It comes as a preference for not wanting to be here. Here, meaning in the world. It will happen only when you realize I am not like this, not like that. If you eliminate everything, in that state you will have no color, no design, no form, no name. Then there is no longer any desire to practice spirituality either. That type of dispassion is called vairagya. Vairagya means no raga, 
Raga means love, love to be. Love to be is also to be discarded. That brings along sadness. That is the emotional state, an aspect of the body-mind, the sadness. If you are not completely clear of this body-mind sense, the sadness is bound to be there. When nobody was here earlier, I gave both of you a very good opportunity to talk, and now you are itching to talk. May I talk now? You shut off all your questions by your previous statement that you had found yourself. That means the object of your spiritual search has been reached. Please explain yourself in greater detail. Before you came here, what were you, and after meeting me, what are you? I would like to hear. Before I came here, everything seemed to go into my head, and I looked at my body and thought of my body all the time. And I used to be concerned about money, very concerned, and also whether or not I would have a job. And sometimes I worked very hard to understand the I am. I read your books and listened to the teachings. I tried very hard to stay in the I am, and I would meditate. And then, then I found myself here somehow, and I said, I am. And I knew it. You understood you are? What is the color of that, the design of that? What is the image of that? Nothing. Find it, then keep quiet. I need to have some disciplines. Until you meet your own self, I am. The disciplines are all very necessary. Once you abide in your own self, they are useless. For then you are no more the body and no longer concerned with all the disciplines pertaining to that body. What about sins and merits after abidance in myself? These are qualities related to the body-mind. So the moment you are no longer the body-mind, these qualities have no further scope with you. First of all, we condition ourselves into the body. We indoctrinate ourselves with the idea I am the body. An example is the air. When the air comes into the body, it is called prana. It is conditioned by the body and confined to the body. Once it is disassociated from the body, that vital breath or prana becomes manifest. It is the universal air. Not only universal air, it becomes the universal space also. So the space is not conditioned by the body. That air is not conditioned by the body. Similarly, your identity is not associated and limited by the body. Therefore, none of your conditionings of the body is binding on you. By your very nature, you are that dynamic manifest consciousness only. No doubt it depends on this quality of I amness, on the vital breath. The latter means air only, air functioning in the body. This air and the knowingness cause the I amness. Out of the prana grows the world, and world means the mind. All that construes you. So when the vital breath quits, there is no more I amness. But the I amness does not die off and remain like a dead body. What is liberation? When you are liberated from the body mind sense so that you are not the body mind, that itself is liberation. My language may not satisfy you, but don't get upset by that. You should try to understand the meaning behind my words. When you are really liberated, when you firmly come to the conclusion, I am not the body, nor the vital breath, the illumination is perfect. Are you the vital breath? Pay attention to the vital breath. Are you the language? Because you can voice the language? Can you be the language? Similarly, I lead you to consciousness. You are in a position to watch consciousness. Therefore, you cannot be the consciousness. You must fully employ your faculty of discrimination and investigate. Before we are caught up with this body-mind sense, we are the para-brahman only. But the moment this I amness appears, we embrace this body-mind as ourselves, and then we are involved in all the concepts and all the problems of the world. That knowingness, that realization, has no color. For one who has realized all this, there is Brahman, the godly state. And the one who knows this godly state is the para-Brahman state. To one who knows the Brahman state, does the world still appear? 
When it is a qualitative, I am to state the world is. Once this state is transcended, there is no world. In the I amness, in the consciousness, the manifest world is there. In the no I amness state, there is no world. The knower of this I amness state and the world within that knower state, there is no world. But in the I amness state, there is a world. But the knower then knows the world. The Parabrahman knows the world. You see this cigarette lighter. You see the flame is like I amness. When the I amness appears, the world also appears. You, like Parabrahman, is watching that. When there is no flame, you see nothing. When the flame is there, I amness has appeared. Therefore, the world has appeared. So, in Parabrahman, you can know both the world and no world. Everything depends on the appearance of that consciousness. If that consciousness is there, then also witnessing of the world happens. If there is no consciousness, then there is no world. Why do you know anything right now? Because I am. Because of that I amness, you know the world. A hundred years back, you did not know anything. Then you were the Parabrahman because the I amness was not there. Can I still be the Parabrahman now? This is no joke, but you can become Parabrahman right now. Only it is not a commodity that you can acquire. You, a hundred years ago, were the Parabrahman. Give me all the information about that state of a hundred years back. Focus your attention only on that consciousness I am. Don't be led astray by all the so-called spiritual disciplines and rigmaroles. Does this consciousness within the body have anything to do with the universal consciousness? One is the expression of the other. If the pulse were not there, could that which is considered the individual body do anything in the world? The life force, the breath, is the expression of the mind and consciousness. When you talk of one, the others have to be there. All the three are made one complex. Without one, the others can't work. Now, the difficulty arises because what this consciousness is, is at once the universal consciousness, that is the feeling of presence. I am presence not. I am present or you are present or he is present. But unfortunately, the identification is with the body and I am, and I am not the whole, but a divisible part of the whole. Therefore, one thinks in terms of acquiring something. But when one sees the situation as it really is, there is no individual involved. That what is present is presence as a whole in merely the expression of the Absolute. Then the moment this is perceived, there is liberation. Liberation is nothing else than seeing this with full conviction. What is the relationship between consciousness and the body? The consciousness, in order to manifest itself, must have a form. And the form is the body. And the body is made up of the essence of the five elements, constituting the sustenance for the consciousness. Without sustenance in the form of the body, whichever body it may be, that of a worm, an insect, or a human being, consciousness could not sustain itself. It is the food essence which sustains consciousness. If the various forms of manifestation are merely the expression of universal consciousness, why is there the feeling of individuality in different forms? Why should each form consider itself a separate one? As soon as that which is the unicity manifests itself, the very manifestation signifies duality. Manifestation means there has to be a subject and an object. Manifestation in space-time means divisibility, and it is the very nature of consciousness that as soon as it manifests itself, there are the opposites, evil, good, large, small, etc. From the moment the manifestation takes place, duality is its very nature, and this must express itself. As soon as there is this manifestation, there is the question of duality, even in the five elements. The air, fire, and water are themselves opposites. So the manifestation itself means duality. If I say that I am ill, 
what does it mean really? For the sake of communication, one uses the word I. But strictly speaking, I have nothing to do with the form. The illness is on that because of which the form is made and is felt in the consciousness. And I am really neither the form nor the consciousness which manifests itself in the form. But for the sake of communication, one says, I am ill. I am worse. I have grown weak or I have grown stronger. But that is merely an expression of the change in the essence of the form. But growing weaker or stronger, undergoing illness or otherwise, has nothing to do with I as such. There are innumerable languages not only among human beings, but also among forms of being other than the human being. But that on which the language is based, that is the mind and the consciousness, does not change. The conditioning which has taken place on that consciousness right from the beginning is the basis of the language of that particular form. Therefore, there are innumerable forms in any number of languages. Now there is a very subtle point in analogy regarding the ordinary language which we know and the spiritual language which we do not yet know, that to which one has been conditioned right from the beginning. That language does not need any special effort for anyone to learn. He or she gets used to it from early childhood, from the earliest conditioning. How? Through constant and consistent association. Similarly, if one has this constant and consistent association with the Yanis, then that language which the Yani speaks and which would normally not be understood by people will gradually be remembered and understood and become natural. Since when does one come to know the experience of suffering? Only since form was created out of the five elements and there was consciousness in that form. But what was the situation before the form was created and the consciousness came into it? One was unmanifest. One had no knowledge of one's existence. There is no question of any experience. And therefore there was a state which was beyond the gross concept of happiness or unhappiness. That was the unicity, where there was not even any question of having experience. In the manifest absolute, there is no consciousness at all, consciousness of existence. So only when there is this universal consciousness manifesting itself in the various forms, and these forms possess the life force, and are subject to the three gunas, can each form act through the life force according to the combination of these gunas. Each form acts according to its own nature. It is only when identification takes place, and I begin to think that I am acting, although it is only the combination of the three gunas that acts, that I assume quite unnecessarily the responsibilities and consequences of those actions, which properly are not mine at all. The actions would have taken place in any case, depending on the three gunas and the life force. It is amazing, almost silly, that anyone could think that he or she is acting. This is what happens. The waking state, before the other gunas start, is from the sattva guna, that is, total harmony. In that split second, when one wakes up, there is total love, total kindness. There is no question of selfishness. So the waking state is of the quality of the sattva guna. Subsequently, there are the physical activities caused by necessities, nature and duties. These derive from the rajas guna. All these activities take place by themselves. But one starts saying, I am doing this identifying and taking on the responsibilities. That is the work of the tamas guna.